Good to have you back on the channel. In this video, we're gonna take a look at a couple of external video recording monitors, the Blackmagic Video Assist 5-inch model and this Atomos Ninja 5. I found myself in the market recently for an external video recorder for a specific project, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about some of the issues and things I had to consider when making a purchase. So I typically use the Sony a6500 camera for everything I do, for travel, for work here in the shop. It's a nice balance of quality, cost, replaceability on the road so I don't have to carry a bunch of backups. You can buy these and their lenses at pretty much any store, like a Best Buy around the country. So it works really well for me, but it definitely has some limitations when it comes to shooting uh, more professional work. When I'm working here and I can control everything and the timing, it's a great camera, but when I'm recording other people, it's absolutely got some limitations. So like most DSLRs and mirrorless cameras of this type, it is limited to 30 minutes of video record time before it'll stop recording video and you have to restart. The second limitation is that the A6500, while its internal recording capabilities are good, it's obviously a portable prosumer type camera. So they've optimized to get more video footage onto the card as opposed to getting the absolute best quality out of the sensor uh, in recording. And then the third issue, although I've never run into it, is this camera is prone to overheating. So if you're running right up to that 30 minute maximum recording over and over, you're definitely going to run a higher chance of overheating. And again, if you're recording somebody else, it's not really ideal to have to stop. And overheating on cameras can be particularly unpredictable because you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know after it overheats how it's going to recover and how soon you'll be able to get back to work or for how long. So some pretty big hurdles there that this camera does have to get over if you want to use it uh, in a more professional setting recording other people. So with an external recorder, we can expand our camera's capabilities quite a bit, and that allows us to record beyond the typical 30 minute record time limit you see on most of these cameras. And taking the burden of recording in the camera away also reduces all the heat that the camera makes. Again, you're not gonna have any issues with overheating running just an HDMI output from most cameras, especially not anything from Sony. Uh, while you're not recording internally, it's just not an issue. The biggest bonus again though is to be able to capture more data from the source when you're making your recording and in many cases your camera will be able to output better video from the HDMI port than it can record internally and again that has to do with a lot of times just heat dissipation and the amount of processing that they can make that camera do inside there in real time. So added benefits include consistency when capturing video from multiple sources for a project. Consistency in files can save huge amounts of time when you're handing them off to other folks to edit especially. And in the case of this Ninja 5, we can use much cheaper SSD media, allowing the ability to plug in a drive and edit footage natively in a program like Final Cut Pro X without needing extra time and space to transcode all of that media when you ingest it. Now that's not only gonna save you time, but huge amounts of space you might not have considered when working with video files. So let's start with the cheaper option. We've got the Blackmagic Video Assist 5-inch 6G model here, and that comes in right around $500. So it's a really attractive option if you've never uh, bought one of these before. That's a great price point to get an external video recorder. It comes with a lot of tools, histogram, uh, false color, all sorts of really helpful tools for uh, being able to compose better shots. And it's a fair deal at 500 bucks. And next to it, we have the Atomos Ninja 5, which typically costs a few hundred dollars more, but has recently been on sale for $600, and it is a screaming deal at that price. I'm not going to wait around or sugarcoat it. My opinion is, if you're in the market for something like this, buy the Ninja 5. There's a whole bunch of reasons why I think it's a better product to use. It's just a little easier personally to work with uh, the menu layout, everything else. But for the reasons I'm going to say in this video, especially if you're in this price bracket, I think the Ninja 5 is hands down the, the purchase to make. It's the smart buy. 
So let's get down to why I think that is. The specs are all pretty easy to find, so let's talk about what matters. It's simply, in my mind, down to the media, and let me explain that a little bit. The Video Assist uses SD cards, which seems simple enough, but finding SD cards for this specific Video Assist 6G model is really not that easy, and it's certainly not that cheap. Recording in the formats that this recorder allows also takes up a lot of space if you want to record for any real amount of time. Again, getting over that 30 minute limitation of most cameras will probably be a priority if this is something you're looking for. So with this model only having the single SD card slot, uh, unlike its bigger relatives, the 7 inch and the 12G models, uh, you're going to need bigger cards. You can't really use smaller cards and have two in there to record over from one to the other, and you can't hot swap them or anything like that. So you're going to want larger SD cards to get that longer record time. So if you go to Blackmagic's website and look at the approved card list, and then you try to order those exact cards, like copy and paste that exact model number, into a browser, you'll find that the model that they're suggesting is a few generations older and they've updated them. So no problem, right? If you ordered that newer model off of Amazon, again, you're copy and pasting from the approved card list to a site like Amazon, taking the most recent result, which by all accounts looks identical. It's just the updated SD card. The machine did not recognize them, couldn't tell that they were inserted. I certainly couldn't format them in the unit, which is the suggested method to format new cards. And no matter how I formatted them outside in a PC or Mac or whatever, they didn't work. That's frustrating. And that left me with only 64 gigabyte cards as the maximum that I could get to work. Again, I ordered the exact same model card from... Amazon, I think it was, might have been B&H, but in 64 gigabytes, and those work fine because there's a number of forum posts out there and different threads over the last year or so of people running into this issue where the newer 128 and 256 gigabyte cards in some cases just won't work with this older hardware. I think it has something to do with the SD card reader built into the Blackmagic Video Assist and some incompatibility with certain very specific models of SD cards uh, by capacity, not the actual name and model number. Again, the 64 gigabyte version worked, but the 128 and 256 weren't even recognized. So pretty frustrating trying to find uh, media for that unit right now. So I did get multiple smaller size cards to work and the unit otherwise performs fine when one of those cards are in there, but a 128 gigabyte card is kind of a sweet spot on the amount of recording time you get in just straight up ProRes versus uh, the cost of the card. It's a good kind of place to be in for a recorder. And I think I used 128 gig cards the last time I used one of the seven inch 12G models of the Blackmagic Video Assist, which I do not believe uh, the newer models suffer from this issue because I've used them before and never had this problem. So, so maybe you get what you pay for ordering the cheapest model. It is worth mentioning, just in case you've never used one of these before, that they don't really do lower quality video. You can drop them down into ProRes LT or Proxy, but they're all pretty heavy duty. They're large file sizes, so, so you're not going to be able to record a whole lot onto these using 32 gig and 64 gigabyte cards. To put this all into context a little bit, I shot the last video, the IO Station 24C video, entirely on the Ninja 5. And it wasn't a very long video, I think 10 or 11 minutes, and it's a pretty small product. So one thing talking to camera like this that's, you know, 15 or so, between 15 and 20 minutes before cutting, and some B-roll that, you know, again, it's not an entire mixing board, so it was a pretty limited amount of B-roll. And that project came out right around 150 gigabytes and that's to end up with a 10 minute or so finished video so by comparison the last nam show i did back in january i took the a6500 i was there for three days i shot a bunch of interviews a couple of them went over an hour uh, hour and a half plus tons of b-roll tons of stuff that i'll probably never use in videos 
But that entire trip, all of that stuff, you know, a couple of hours worth of interviews, everything only came out to 170 gigabytes. So you can tell the scale of, you know, a 10 minute video or enough footage from three days to create a bunch of different videos. I mean, it's a, it's a major difference in the amount of data we're talking about, but there's a reason why that trade-off is worth it. So what's the reason? Why would you possibly want to shoot 150 gigabytes for a 10 minute video? Why would you want to shoot so much uh, footage there? You, you know, surely your computer is going to choke. It's going to be hard to work with. And for me, that's actually exactly the opposite. So what happens when I shoot 170 gigabytes or whatever on the A6500? If I'm at a trade show, for instance, I want to back all that footage up. So that's important. And then I usually want to pull it into Final Cut and either create some social media clips or start an edit or just see what I've got and kind of get a feel for, did I get everything? Do I need to go back and look at, you know, something again or what have you? So after a full day at the trade show, I've got to copy all that footage from the SD card over to another drive of some sort for backup. Usually I'll copy it to two SSDs. I'll copy it to one just to put away and then another one that I'll actually start working off of. Well, then I import it into Final Cut and I've got to transcode all of that footage. And when I'm on the road, it'll be, you know, 2015 MacBook Pro. But here at home, I, my main editing computer is a 2011 iMac. It's a nine year old computer and doing all that transcoding on either of these computers, it takes a ton of time. My fans are spooled up all the way and there's not much else I can do with the machine. I've just got to sit there and kind of wait. And that really does eat up a lot of time, especially you're in a hotel room and you want to go to sleep <laughs> a lot of time. So it can be frustrating. Now, the 150 gigabytes that I would shoot on this is on an SSD. And all I've got to do is plug that SSD here. I've got one. This one's in a caddy right here. So this is in the Atomos caddy, which funny enough, you don't need. You can just plug right into the back. I, you know, this isn't an endorsement or anything, but you can just plug one of these right into the back. And if you're not walking around, if you're just like here on the desktop, it works just fine. And this is a 500 gigabyte SSD. They're super cheap. And when you get back to your computer, I've got a couple of USB three adapter cables that plug right into these SSDs and you've got your footage. You can copy it to another SSD very fast. It's much, much faster than transferring footage off of an SD card. And these cost dramatically less for the same amount of storage, the speed of the storage than an SD card does. And the best part is when I import this footage into Final Cut Pro, I can start working. There's no transcoding. So that 150, 170, whatever it is, gigabytes worth of footage doesn't automatically start to become three or 400 gigabytes of footage once you create all those proxies, the optimized media. If you go back and look at some of your projects that you've created on smaller cameras or on regular cameras, I should say, and then look at the media in the library you've created for that project and wherever you're putting your optimized media and your proxy media that your computer needs to be able to work and edit smoothly and work faster than the, the codec that your camera's recording in, uh, that media can just make your drives fill up so quickly. There's been so many projects where I've shot a lot of footage and halfway through the edit, I, you know, you get the pop-up saying that you're running out of disk space and it's going, what, you know, what the heck I edit off one terabyte drives normally. This is just much simpler for me anyway, for my workflow, being able to plug this in and immediately see what's on there and start working with that footage and creating social media clips and knowing that if I shot 150 gigabytes worth of footage, that's all it's going to be. It's 150 gigabytes worth of footage. I can account for that. I can move it around easier. I don't have to constantly worry about the actual files, the proxies, the optimized media, all that kind of stuff. Now, obviously I'm shooting 1080 60p. So if you're shooting higher than that, you're definitely going to be getting into working with proxies depending on your system anyway. But this is just a really, really great uh, option for me to cut all that time and moving files around and extra steps out of the process. So for my use, the Ninja 5 ended up being perfect. It really has been an awesome tool and a really nice addition to just shooting with the camera like I have been for quite a while. It, it's a really huge difference to be able to frame up shots on a nice screen, to have all of these different uh, 
features and tools right on board to be able to make sure you're getting the shot that you want. And just things like being able to get focus on a screen this big uh, with focus peaking and everything else is hugely beneficial over uh, an A6500. Those tiny screens on the back of a camera are really hard to see if you're nailing focus. The other nice thing about this one is it comes with this cool tally light so you can see when it's actually recording. So that's really nice. I keep it on this tripod, but I've mounted it to the camera as well, so I can move it around all as one unit. That's really helpful. You've got mic line input, headphone output, which is nice, takes the audio over HDMI, so it's recording. Uh, let me see if I can get back to, oh boy. Yeah, maybe we can see there. You can see all the different channels. Right now, I'm just recording two-channel audio. Uh, I'm recording audio separately, and the audio that's recorded to this is just the camera's microphones, built-in microphones, being sent down the HDMI. So that's really nice. If you were to plug in external audio to this unit, you can still keep your camera audio uh, recorded as reference. So that's really nice that it's giving you uh, all those audio tracks. Another really cool feature about this that I didn't notice at first is if I hit the power button, it doesn't go off. You've got to actually go to the menu and hold down the power button for four seconds. So it's pretty hard to power this off accidentally. And otherwise, this thing's just been great. The screen looks awesome on this. That's the one thing that I probably noticed more than anything side by side with the Black Magic is the screen quality on this unit is just so much better, in my opinion. It's just nicer to look at. It's a much cleaner look on these two models. The the seven inch and the bigger model Black Magic Video Assist, the newer ones uh, are not the same thing. I'm comparing this with the five inch 6G model that is obviously being shown here. And the Ninja 5 is night and day difference in my opinion as to the quality and what it just feels like to shoot on this just looks really good when you shoot on and it gives you that confidence that you're getting the shots that you want so that's it just some thoughts on the practical side of external video recorders and trying to find one that works when you're on a budget and looking at the lower priced models that are super popular both of them will get the job done and they do a really decent job at recording good quality video in a reliable way just for my use i could not find sd cards that would work with that unit that uh were either affordable or readily available i'm sure there are going to be people out there that have uh figured that out and which one actually works well at that 128 gigabyte size if there is one uh, but going based off of what the list suggested and what i normally buy what i'm comfortable with pretty much everything i work with is sandisk i've no affiliation with media companies whatsoever i wish i did it's one of the things i spend the most money on but i just kind of standardized a few years ago after trying lexar and i think i've got more lexar cards over here i just kind of started buying sandisk all the time i'm not sure if there is a 128 or 256 gig card option out there that other folks have had good luck with so i'd be interested to hear about that down below if you are using one of those the 6g 5 inch unit what are you using for media and what's your experience been like maybe over the years if you've owned it for a few years so i'm glad i got this ninja 5 it's uh, really cool and it's changing the way I work, especially as far as transcoding and having to deal with proxies and all that kind of stuff. So I'll get into my workflow again in the future of how I shoot, back up, put all the media onto this Windows server, actually, this Windows computer acts as a server, and then I can access all that media over the network. I don't edit over the network, but I do uh, pull media from the server to local SSDs for editing, and then I back it back up to the server when I'm done the project so I can clear those local SSDs uh, for future projects. So I'll get into that in a future episode if anybody's interested in how to like kind of work with media like this, digital content creation on a real world budget. There's tons of videos out there about building these massive servers and all these crazy projects that are awesome. I really wish I could uh, do a lot of that functionality. A lot of it seems really cool to be able to put all your stuff on a central server, edit remotely over, you know, crazy fast uh, internal network speeds. But you know, as most of us are struggling just to get content made and get it out and not lose it. So maybe I'll go into some more detail on how I manage files on a real world budget with mostly secondhand or refurbished gear uh, in a future episode if you're interested. Until then, thanks to everybody who supports the channel on Patreon. 
Patreon. I'm focusing a lot more on Patreon right now, you might notice, and there's some reasons behind that too that we'll get into uh, in the future. I'll see you next time.